like to talk today about a thing you may not have, if you thought about it naively, you may have thought it, it's not possible. I'd like to talk about taking a project and having principled ways of estimating not only how many defects are there out there that we know about, which we keep track of in our issue tracking, but how many defects are there out there that we don't know about? Getting some estimate of what's that size of, of undiagnosed defects. Why is that important? Why might we want to know how many undiagnosed defects it's are big, there? and if defect shows up, we shouldn't be like super surprised. Okay, that's true. And in fact, if you're dealing with defects that are being found, let's suppose in the last week there have been no defects found. Is that good news or bad news? That's bad news. Both. Okay, it could be good news in the sense that we've gotten just about all of them out. It could be bad news in the sense that there's plenty there, we're just not very good at finding them. It could be the plateau of finding yeah. uh, defects that week. Yeah, we it could be. The That's right, that we found a certain subset of defects and we just haven't gotten to a new type of defect. Yeah. So dealing with defect, you know, new defects discovered to judge you know, how many defects, uh, you know, how are we doing is, is a bit ambiguous. Certainly, if we find tons of defects, <laughs> we know there's a problem. But if we find very, very few, it could just be our testing isn't up to snuff this week, it, or it's not finding defects as effectively. Or it could be this few out there. And this, these set of techniques can provide you a way to, an actionable way, with at least two of them, and I'd suggest one of them in particular, that I'd like you to put in place for your teams, for your team, to, to try to diagnose how many undiagnosed defects are there out there, okay? It's very actionable. You can engage in it and come up with a number that will give you some sense as to how big is that total volume of defects. Time is short, and so I'm gonna go through this pretty quick. And I'm gonna emphasize ones that are applicable to you. There's really three approaches that are reasonably common. One is you use historic data. If you're a Microsoft or you're a Yahoo or you're a Facebook or you're a Twitter uh, or you're a uh, Amazon, you actually have a lot of historic data. And you can use historic data, with similar technology, similar teams to try to give some sense as to how far along in the defect discovery phase are we? If you're NASA and you're using pretty similar technologies, you can use that. A second technique is defect seeding. And this, this technique takes a little bit of mind expansion to, to appreciate it, but it's pretty, uh, it can be pretty effective if it's used well. And the final technique, which I'd like to encourage you to employ, in fact, I'll be a bit disappointed if you don't employ, is defect pooling, okay? We'll talk about each of these with more of a focus in the latter two. So each of these approaches, you know, it's imperfect. It has limited accuracy. It can add a bit of complications to schedule and it's, it has some assumptions around it, which are often broken. And it has a, a risk of duplication of effort for particularly for defect pooling and to some degree for seeding as well. But I would argue that putting these in place, despite their shortcomings, is a lot better than not having any of these mechanisms in place. In short, the benefits more than outpace the cost of doing this, the shortcomings, okay? So the first technique I mentioned was that, that many companies can practice. Even, even places like Vendasti here in town, or Yardi, for example, um, Vexima, uh, Sastel, they have large number of projects, large number of developers, often using overlapping software, et cetera. And the basic deal here is look, projects like this, you get a pretty good understanding as to how many defects make their way into the code base with this sort of technology. So if you have five React Native projects led by various developers, some with similar rough levels of experience, you can at least 
eyeball within a factor of you know two, how many defects uh, you might expect per thousand lines of code. And you could see, okay, how many defects have we discovered? What's the density of currently found defects? Maybe we found one defect per thousand lines of code. And you know, historically it's about five per thousand lines of code. You know, there's probably four fifths of the defects out there are not yet found, okay? It's rough, but it can give you a sense there's a lot out there, or we're getting close to the end of the curve. Now, what are, what are some limitations of this? I'm trying to present it charitably, but what are some limitations? New companies and new groups can't really use it. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so, suppose you found your own software startup, something I'll be talking about later in this class, having founded a number of them successfully myself. Um, how, how do you apply this? Even if you're a large company, what changes? Developers. Yeah, developers change. You have developers of all different levels of experience. What else? Technology, right? Four years ago, React Native was not a big player. If you used Angular four years ago, then Angular 2 came out. You switched to Angular 2, and a lot of things changed, totally. Now Google Flutter is out. What historical data do we have on uh, Google Flutter? Or you know, if, if we're doing development in Swift as opposed to development Objective C for iOS development, how can we directly use statistics from the Objective C era for our Swift era, much less for a Google Flutter or, or React Native applications? It's kind of apples and oranges. So it's it's a hard thing. What else changes besides programming languages and environments? Tools change. Debugging technologies. Synon, Enzyme. They go through different evolutions. It may be faster to chase down defects. It may be easier to put in place assertions. And you end up catching things before people build on a bug, etc. So historic data is, yes, you can do it particularly if you're a Google or you're an Amazon, you have lots of groups working on similar technologies. You could probably do it within a factor of two or three, but it's not gonna be that great for your project. And projects differ. Why do projects differ? Size of the project. Yeah, the size and complexity of the project. It can be quite different, quite different. Okay, now the next, so I wanna introduce two other strategies, one of which is immediately actionable. I could leave this room and you could engage in the strategy I'm discussing and before the sun sets, you could have estimates of undiagnosed defects in your system. Actually, I think this is gonna be increasingly applicable after ID3 because the product remains in a more embryonic phase at the current time. But ID3 will be a step forward that I hope to be, if not for the ages, at least, at least it will, it, it will be a, a big step forward. Perhaps not a giant leap for mankind, but an but a important, important stride for Dr. Wapa's vision. So the techniques I'm going to suggest are rooted around a, a tagging analogy. This is going to hold for both these. If you understand this, you'll be able to figure out the formulas and give them back to me when it comes time for the final exam. Hmm? Okay. So, suppose, here's the question. Suppose we're dealing with defects. We don't know how many defects are out there. And I'm going to make an analogy. It's kind of like we're dealing with a big slough or a pond, a lake, and we want to estimate the total number of fish out there, right? We're interested in walleye and reindeer lake or, or in Walston Lake or what have you. Um, suppose you have 100 fish tags, these tags that can be used to, to mark a fish as something you've seen before, maybe even with a number, right? How do you proceed? What would you do? i go to a specific square area. Okay. Fish in that area. Okay, catch them. Mm -hmm. Do I have a limited of 100? 
You have 100 fish tags. Yeah. So I can't have more than 100? No. no. Sure, you could have 1,000. So I'd like tag 100 here, tag 100 okay. here, and then see the areas, and then I'd average it out. Okay. And then let's say I get the average, and then multiply by the area of the whole lake. Okay. Okay, so you're figuring out how many you're like for, let's say picking one up one in one different one areas? Like a one by one meter okay. square. Okay, so so why are you tagging them? How is that getting into it? Well, if they leave the square, they've already been tagged. So it's like, uh, so if I okay. pick one up and put it back down, I'll keep picking up and put it down the, the, the same, same one. one. Okay, yeah, yeah good, good analogy. I'll, I'll um, what's that? You can tag 100 fish. Yeah. And then release them to the pub. Yeah. And then you get, say, like, 12 fish, you, you capture 12 fish, and then you see how many fish are tagged. Yeah. And then you from from the average of the 12 fish, you yeah. may provide an estimate on good. how many fish there are. Tagged. That's good. I think Mo, so I like that. So if you're dealing with a slew, you know, there's a moderate size, maybe you're not going to sample systematically like Mo. I, I mean, Mo was thinking in a fairly sophisticated way, a large, like, I said reindeer lake, which is a big lake. Yeah. It's a really big lake. And whereas if we were dealing with, you know, the the, the back 40 slough or something, you know, it would be, you uh, it, it, it might just do it, you, you catch them once, you tag them, you throw them back, you catch again, and you see how many are tagged. And that gives you a sense of numerator denominator. You know, you catch, uh, caught us so many. So, okay. So suppose you caught and tagged and released 50 fish, right? Then you catch 100 more fish. And you find that of those, five, of these 100 fish that you caught, five of them were found to be tagged. Hmm? How many, how many um, uh, of, of fish would you estimate are in the entire, uh, in, entire uh, Entire pond. Do you tag those five fish? So uh, they're, already you, they're they're already they're already tagged. So it's you like you like caught them the second have, time around. Right. Five out of fifty. Yeah, exactly. Of okay, so that one tenth, uh, you you found among these hundred, you found mm -hmm. one tenth of them so you, of, of of all of yeah. all that you tagged. So you multiply about the about yeah. the reciprocal of one yeah. tenth. Yep. Yep. Or divide by. Okay, that's good. So the look the idea here is that. We caught five out of these 50 fish, tagged fish, in that second catch, right? Mm -hmm. Within this second catch of 100 fish, we caught 10% of all the tagged fish. And we're going to estimate that, look, that, that these 100 fish are therefore probably one-tenth of the fish, not only of the ones we tagged, but in the whole lake, right? If we imagine that the fish are pretty well mixed, look, we found 10% of the fish we tagged, you know, within these 100. Uh, why are the fish we tagged any different? What, we'll assume what's, we got 10% of all fish within this. So we're going to estimate there's 1,000 fish in the entire slew, right? Does that make sense? So the idea is, look, you know, we tagged 50 fish. And this later catch of 100 fish, we found 10% of them. 10% of them. And so, well, guess, well, these 100 fish are probably about 10% of the whole lake. Just I means so just the lake has about 1,000 fish, yeah? So that's, it. that's the basic idea here behind the fish tagging strategy. And this is going to follow us for the next time. Now, it has some big assumptions, and Mo was thinking ahead. I was going to say, what happens if you catch 100 and none of them are tagged? Yeah. That's yeah, well, well let, let me ask this. This is a good, very good question. So suppose you found, you caught 100 more fish and all of them were tagged. What do you think? Versus, suppose, so that's one case, case A. You, you catch 100 fish and all of them are the ones you already tagged. Versus case B, you catch 100 fish and only one of them is tagged. Which of those would suggest there's more fish in the lake? One. Yeah, if if you caught a hundred fish and only one of them is tagged, there's a lot of fish in that there lake, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Or how if none of them are tagged? Well, there must be a lot of fish there, right? 
Whereas if you caught uh, these hundred fish and all, you know, included all the 50 fish you caught, is that suggesting there's a lot of fish in that lake? No, probably not. Now there's some pretty big assumptions though here. One is, and Mo was getting into this a little bit, it was it catches a fish are independent. You know, like if you're catching in the same area of the lake, you're not gonna be, it's not gonna be very good for, for something like reindeer lake. You're gonna catch a lot of the same fish in that same area again, right? Um, uh, and you know, maybe you're only catching the fish that are at the top of the lake, the, the, you know, not the deep lunkers, the ones that are, that are down there uh, in the deeper areas of the lake. And so maybe you're not, you're not doing a really good uh, job in estimating, you know, the total number in the lake because you're just dealing with the surficial fish, the, the top fish, right? Maybe the list, uh, maybe the, you know, you're only catching the more, the more easy to catch fish and the other ones are not being caught. And so you can't really easily estimate them. There's a lot of estimates here, and particularly this idea that your catch now, catch two, is independent of catch one, is a big one. And Mo was right on that from the start. He didn't want the second catch to, to just be the same fish as the first catch, right? Um, you you want to do it in, in different areas of the lake, right? So I'm going to use this for two strategies. And I'm going to suggest the second one, but I want to introduce the first one. And I wouldn't be, a, I wouldn't protest if we use the second one, although it's possible Mo one. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> this is called defect seeding, and you may be getting a an inkling where this is going. And if you're shocked, maybe you, it's you, maybe you understand where this is going. So the idea of defect seeding is you seed defects. So you actually insert artificial defects into the system. And these defects should be fairly varied, many levels of severity and broad areas of the system. And you seed before the tests really begin, before the big testing of the system begins. Okay, suppose you seed a whole bunch of defects. Suppose Jesse's working overtime as normal and he seeds 100 defects. Or maybe it's Austin, because Jesse's doing the testing, a lot of the testing. Maybe Austin seeds 100 defects the day before Jesse starts to test. And Jesse does a bunch of testing. And suppose Jesse only finds one of those 100. What does that suggest about the testing? He did 1%. His testing is... I mean, it may be good, but it's, it's not very thorough not in deep. terms of finding, finding defects. There's a lot of defects out there that are not being found, right? By contrast, suppose Jesse finds 99 of the ones that Austin seeded. It's pretty good, it's pretty good testing Jesse's got in place. What if he finds like 50 of Austin's and then 20 of yeah. the program that we didn't seed? Well, that's a bit like that second catch of fish finding some tagged ones and some untagged ones, right? Th so does that suggest it's good or does that suggest it's bad? Cause oh, if he, if he finds lots that were not among yours, it would suggest there's a lot of defects out there because maybe he's only found half of Austin's, the ones that Austin's, um, Austin's found oh, yeah. among, you know, a thousand total defects he's found. I would suggest maybe there's 2,000 defects out yeah, there. He was busy with the ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so what are uh, the formula here is is very analogous to the to the ones we saw with with fish, right? You have a total number of de uh, found defects divided by the seeded defects uh, found times total seeded uh, divided by total seeded defects. So look, if if uh, we found 50% of Austin's, right? Seeded defects found over total seeded defects is 0.5. And suppose, suppose uh, in his excellent work, Jesse has found 1,000 possible defects here, total number, then he has about 2,000 that are probably out there in the entire system. 2,000 by it's 1,000 divided by 0.5, okay? Or you can phrase it this way, total CD defects divided by CD defects found 
times the total number. Okay, it's completely analogous to the fish, the fish analogy. Now, some caveats. Seeding defects sound scary for good reason. You need to intercept these quickly. You don't want people to be spending a huge amount of time debugging these. Because fundamentally, it's not a natural defect. It's a deliberately introduced one. So, you know, it would be a, a, a terrible thing if Mo spent the better part of a night trying to fix this defect that Austin seeded. When it, you know, it's, it's an artificial defect. Why should Mo spend his time fixing that instead of other things, right? So you got to intercept them quickly before they cause things, before they cause Mo or other developers resentment, right? I mean, it's like, man, I spent hours and it's just this dumb thing, you know. Um, it even it even had Austin's initials in it, you know, <laughs> his signature or something. That that's that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, and you want to keep them fairly simple, like only chain to give a few lines of code. And you want to. And, and, and what's worse is you don't want Dr. Waba seeing the result of a defect that Austin seeded, right? Where instead of coming up with, you know, um, um, the, the picture of a patient, it shows Dr. Waba or worse, Taylor Swift, right? Okay. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Is this, um, is this like, a, uh, like that kind of mutation testing? How is it different? It, it, you, you can think of it as, as having, a, it's very close to relate to mutation testing, yeah. So you can basically tweak certain lines. Did you learn about mutation testing in, in 370? Yeah. Oh, okay, great, great. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's quite closely aligned with some of the ideas of mutation testing, yeah. So you can, you could basically tweak areas of the code and see, if, yeah. Would it be a bad idea to create a branch and then um, kind of on that branch, mm -hmm. seed stuff, and then throw it to Jesse? Yeah. No, I think that's great. And run his test. Yeah, so let him yep. like, run the test on that branch. So totally. Developers can keep going on the yep. branch. Yeah. Oh, that, that's very common. And in fact, I had a slide which showed that. Okay. But it didn't show introducing defects. But you could do it with defects so to see how many, how many of them are caught by Jesse's test. Okay. And I will tell you, if you were to do that, and you were to tell me Jesse's tests aren't finding many, I would still view it as a great accomplishment in your team. I, I would think that's a great thing to do. And uh, I'm not gonna be, it's not a matter that the code testing quality is bad and I'll use it against it. It's you've helped realize that you need to improve your testing. And that is the key thing. This class is all about learning. I mean, I, at the end, I don't really care that I would, uh, if your quality is bad, I want you to realize that you've got to up your quality and prove it. <laughs> and say, yes, I'd like to see high quality, but what's more important is I'd like to see you realize, okay, we've got to do better next time. And that's why for this class, the post-mortem is really important. It's, it's not just how far you get, it's your conscious thinking about where you could go and do it even better. Okay? Okay, now... This is, the next technique is one I'm going to recommend. Defect seeding is great. And it can be a bit fun. It's like Easter eggs, right? Hiding Easter eggs and seeing how many, how many are found by the coverage testing. Okay. Um, the next one though is defect pooling. And unfortunately, the size of the group here is a little bit of a challenge, but you could still do it. The idea here is, look, you divide your team into two pools of testers. So I could imagine, you know, two pools of two, something like that, right? And each of the groups goes off and independently tries to find defects on the same version of the code, same amount of time, same number of people, ideally, okay, in each group. So maybe group A found 400 and group B found 350. And then, there's this key thing here which I'm highlighting. Why is that key? Why am I emphasizing this? Is that the set of defects that both people found? Okay, good. So I want to go through the reasoning here quite, clear, uh, quite carefully. So suppose there were, between these two groups, suppose there were almost no common defects. That's a problem. 
Why is that a worry? Because that means there's so many defects that you guys didn't even like meet in the middle. Yeah, yeah. So there's so many defects out there. You could find tons without having any overlap, right? By contrast, suppose this, suppose instead of 150, this was 300 defects in common. What would that suggest? Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Suggests that there's more defects that are like easy to find, or that you're consistent like, the same way. Yeah. <laughs> it, it can. It can be. Yeah. With no assumptions, <laughs> like assuming that you guys aren't testing the same yeah. way. Yeah. You'd say that there's only like 400 defects if. Yeah. If there's like a big overlap of 300. It's a, if it's a big overlap of 300, it's certainly less concerned if there's only like two that are overlapping. Yeah. Right. Which would suggest. You could keep on going and discovering defects without getting a huge overlap. Without, you're still not going to be getting this at, you know, again, there's plenty more out there that you can get. So this is a very important point because when you're thinking about this, it's easy to, it may be easy to get caught up in this idea that, look, if there's more defects and overlapping, it's bad because it means there's, you're, you're finding more defects. No, actually the overlap is an indication of is there a limited pool out there that we're finding, you know, um, we keep on finding basically the same basic defects or are we finding just totally different ones? Another 10 hours of testing, another 20 hours of testing, we'd just be discovering thousands of unrelated defects, right? Thousands of defects being found that could shock Dr. Wabha and shake him to the bone, right? Okay. Okay, so the basic idea here hopefully is, is fairly uh, clear. So you have two different pools of people operating off the full software and testing, this is important, not just the same areas of the software. They should be testing the software as a whole across different areas and using ideally with different strategies, coming up with their own strategies. Why wouldn't you want them to use the same strategy? That's right. If they're testing basically with the same strategy, same set of tests, for example, then you're going to be having a large number found in, in common just as an artifact of that, right? By contrast, if they're using very different approaches, if they're hammering away in it with separate approaches, you are going to have a much more balanced situation. You don't predispose it to a large number of overlaps, right? Um, and the basic formula here is comes from the same reasoning we had for fish, but it can be it can be broken down to this defects. So if you have two groups, this is a, a, a common exam question, by the way. If you have two groups, group A, group B, the total number of defects that are estimated to be out there are defects in pool A times defects in pool B divided by defects in both pools A and B. Okay, and I, I give the analogy here. Could you expect us to memorize that? Yeah. Like the formula? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, or at least to be able to tell me what the answer is. I mean, it doesn't have to be this precise formula. I give another one here, which is equivalent to it. But yeah, I expect you to be able to know, given this situation, for example, how many total defects might there be? Yeah. yeah? Um, and the analogy here is, you know, okay, we have fish caught for tagging and fish caught later. And we have and ones caught in second round that are tagged and, and the, this uh, formula directly falls out of it, okay? Um, so I'd like to be able to, to reason this through. This is the same fish tagging strategy. So if you know that formula, you should be able to try to apply it in this case. So the suggestion here which each year seems to be a point of great fun, is run a bug party. Two different groups, they have their own bug parties, same time, not leaking to each other, not talking on Slack and Hangouts, you know, oh, check it out. You know, this area of the system is really weak. Operating independently, a couple hours each, so you get a number of, of bugs. Identify list defects, and then, you go to identify the common ones and the ones that are not in common. And you estimate the total defect count, right? The 
total number of the fish in the pond there. Okay? That's the basic idea of defit pooling. It's very actionable. I would love to see this done. I don't know if any team has done this more than once in the projects, but many have done it at least once, and all it takes is a couple hours. You could actually do it at somewhat different times as long as you don't leak the information. It's the same version of the project, et cetera. It's not, and there's no overlap between the groups because you don't want it to you know, bias it a lot. What's the downside of this? There's all sorts of limitations, sure. But what's the downside? Um, it takes a lot of different people, uh, a little um, resource heavy. Yeah, yeah, because you're finding a lot of common defects, right? And, and you might say, well, why can't these folks focus on areas that haven't been tested? Well, the whole point of it is to be able to estimate the total number of defects. So looking at this once in common is good. But bug parties are great for more than this. I mean, this is one use of a bug party, and it's fantastic. But, uh, you know, you could do a bug parties outside of this. But do this, and it'll be a real asset for your project. I wouldn't do it quite yet, because I think the project uh, is, is as of yet young, yeah. particularly with the 360 final. Was that yesterday? Midterm, yeah. 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 Um, the midterm. So um, uh, I understand you've been working on that, but now is the time to really push, probably after ID3, do this and uh, get a sense of how many defects are out there. You get a sense of how much Jesse's, I mean, one thing you could do is look at team A, team B, and then see what Jesse's automated testing is finding, right? Which in a way is yet another pool, and, and you could look at that. Today we had our formal inspection with Jesse, so. Oh, good. We finally kind of know how to test. <laughs> good, yeah. good, that's excellent. I'd like to see things spread around, okay? So, so yes, you are responsible for these formulas, but more to the point, I would encourage you to put this into place so you know, put this into place for your project so you know how much, um, uh, where you're at with your testing, okay? Um, I wasn't sure how much time we'd have for that, so that's all.